Hello and welcome to this 2019 election special from Fidelity Personal Investing. Polling day is approaching and we've now seen manifestos from the major parties, including completely divergent plans for tax, spending and the economy generally. Our task today is to discuss what it might mean for investors. And to do that, I'm joined by Tom Stevenson, Investment Director here at Fidelity. Tom, welcome along. Thanks, Ed. Um, there's a lot to discuss, clearly, uh, but let's start with that point that I make there. Voters really can't complain in this election that they don't have a clear choice between the parties because they are offering very different things. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, for, in many ways, I think this is the most interesting election for, for years and years. The first election that I got to, to vote in was actually 1983, and I, and I actually see some similarities there. That. Uh, uh, that election uh, was uh, one between Margaret Thatcher and Michael Foote. Extreme differences on uh, social and, and, and economic questions. I mean, interestingly, the, uh, the, the manifesto which Labour um, published then was famously described by another Labour MP, actually, as the longest suicide note in history. And, the, and what the point that there was that this was a very extreme, radical manifesto. And, of course, that is what we face now. We're really faced today with a genuine choice about the type of country that we want to live in and, and much of that is expressed in, in, in economic terms but it's broader than that as well. Yeah and that difference you talk about is captured um, in the statistic that's been doing the round this week uh, which is to do with the size of the outlay of spending between the different parties and it says that in for every one pound of extra day-to-day -day spending being promised by the Conservatives there's 28 pounds of extra spending being offered by Labour, and that's probably a reflection of the ambition of the Labour plans on one side and the modesty of the Conservative plans on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. And to put that in, in, in pounds terms, uh, Labour are, are promising to spend £83 uh, billion pounds, uh, and the Conservatives are promising to spend £3 billion. Pounds. And you're right that the £83 billion pounds is a measure of the, uh, the scale of the ambition of uh, Labour's plan. It is a complete... Uh, rewriting of the economic uh, landscape in, uh, in this country. The Tories, on the other hand, have gone to the other extreme. They are playing it very safe. And uh, I think the reason they're doing that is that they, they have to play it safe because in order to gain a majority in this election, they have to appeal to both the Brexiteers on the one hand and to Labour um, leave uh, voters on the other hand and they have very different agendas so in order to appeal to both of those they're having to play it very cautiously and not give the opposition the ammunition they need to, to shoot down uh, the Tory plans. Yeah and this is an election uh, election time and a political debate of course so there's, there's sort of uh, this is all in the eye of the beholder I suppose you, how you view all this stuff. Labour talk about their spending plans and we'll put them in uh, an international context and also in the context of history and we'll say actually Ambitious, yes, a big change, yes, but what we're doing is returning spending to levels uh, that other European countries have as a proportion of GDP, and um, we're reversing the effects of austerity, which has been, been in place since 2008-9. Yes, that's true. Uh, and you know, the, the, the sort of spending which Labour is talking about would not be you know, out of line with the spending which is, which is done by, by many Europe developed European governments. However, compared to history, it does represent a very significant uh, rise. Spending is currently about, I think, 38% of, of GDP. Labour's plans would take it to something like 44%, which is probably the highest level actually in peacetime. Yeah, OK. Well, um, I wanted to run through some of the potential policy changes that are now in the manifestos that will affect our finances. Um, and a natural place to start is income tax. That's probably the tax that everyone's uh, most familiar with and knows most about. Um, Boris Johnson's pledge for the Conservatives is no change to income tax or national insurance rates, although there would be a small change in the level at which people start paying national insurance. That's effectively a, a, a cut in what people pay. Labour, on the other hand, much more ambitious. It's pledged no change for those earning up to £80,000 a year, this famous figure that we're hearing a lot about. After that and above that, earnings, um, it's very different. Uh, above 80k, there's a 45% tax rate proposed and above 125,000, a rate of 50%. Um, most people are not going to be paying that extra tax where it's come to pass. 
but it still proved very controversial, particularly in the last week or so, hasn't it? You're absolutely right to point out that, you know, uh, the, the £80,000 cutoff uh, means that 95% of the workforce in this country won't pay any more income tax. But it's an interesting uh, dividing line because it's essentially how uh, Labour is presenting its tax proposals is a sort of billionaires and uh, bankers on one side and ordinary workers on the other side. Um, and I'm not sure that that's how someone earning £80,000 a year really views themselves. Mm. Do they consider themselves to be part of the uber rich, yeah. a billionaire or a banker? Absolutely, no, they don't. And also, I think it's important to, to make the point that people who are earning a bit less than 80,000 probably have aspirations to earn a bit more. And that they will, they will question whether um, they should really be lumped in with the super rich and be targeted by, by Labour in the way that they are. Yeah, it's all about context, isn't it? Because if you're earning 80K in a, a cheaper part of the country, and if maybe you have um, N no dependents, and you have a partner that earns a similar amount of money, that might seem a lot of money. You'd be very, very well off. But if you are supporting a family, which is a choice, of course, um, but maybe you've taken on a lot of debt to get professional, qualification professional qualifications in order to earn that amount of money, you might feel slightly different about that kind of rhetoric around around how this has been described. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just you just don't don't feel that that description, that, that negative description, really applies to your family circumstances. People in those uh, situations might think that they're actually, you know, it, it, it struggling and would be overstating it. But you know, they are in that squeeze middle. Yeah. Um, okay. Another big tax change pledged by Labour, um, doesn't get the headlines of the income tax change, but from an investment point of view, could be very significant. Uh, and that's to do with capital gains. And at the moment, of course, we have a capital gains tax rate of either 20% or 28% for property, investment property gains. Um, and what they're proposing is that those rates would be basically equalised to whatever your income tax rate is. Now, um, it's hard to see that any of that is going to be particularly positive for investors, but there's important things to say about uh, where you invest and in, uh, investing inside tax wrappers, inside ISAs and SIPs. Yeah. Uh, so just to clarify a little bit, so the, the rates that you talked about there, the 20% and the 28%, that's for higher rate uh, taxpayers. Indeed. So there's also a 10% uh, capital gains uh, tax rate for, for basic rate taxpayers. The Labour proposition is that, uh, is that uh, gains from wealth, essentially, so from things like shares and, and property, should be taxed in the same way as gains from income. And, you know, philosophically, I don't think many people would probably disagree with that. Um, uh, but from an investor's point of view, it is clearly an unhelpful uh, development. Um, and so I think what it does is it really focuses attention on the absolute um, need to use the, um, uh, the, the tax-free vehicles that you can. So, you know, to, to put your money to the extent that you can in an ISA or in a SIP. Uh, and the, the uh, allowances for both of those are very generous, of course. £20,000 for, for an ISA, both for you and for your partner. So that's £40,000 potentially within a within a household and up to £40,000 within, within a SIP a year. So both of those are quite generous and absolutely we should definitely be looking at them particularly uh, if we see capital gains tax uh, disappearing as, a, as an adv advantageous um, uh, tax situation. And, and we should uh, emphasise that they've also, Labour have also said um, that they would do the same sort of equalisation with the income tax rate for dividends as well. Uh, yes, absolutely. So for, for investors, both capital gains uh, and dividends, obviously important parts of their total return and the, the tax situation may deteriorate considerably. So, so use these allowances. OK, well, let's turn to the uh, economy more widely uh, and the environment for companies in particular. Um, there's plenty of discussion about the rate of corporation tax, and this gets to the heart of the sort of ideological issue that you've spoken about. Um, the Conservatives have said for their part, they're not doing anything, but they're not, not, they're not doing something, which was a planned cut in the rate from its current 19% down to 17% corporation tax in April. They're not going to do that anymore. But in contrast, Labour have said they would reverse many of the corporation tax cuts that we've seen in the last decade back to a level of 26%. Uh, they say, and it's true to say, in fact, that that's the level that it was 
in 2011. So we've managed with corporation tax levels uh, at 26% before. Um, is it a big deal for, for companies to be paying higher rates of corporation tax? I think you know I, on its own, it's not a it's not a big deal. You're right. Historically, we've 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 lived with those kinds of rates before. And if you compare uh, Britain with uh, other developed nations, then those kinds of uh, corporation tax rates are are not out of the ordinary at all. I think you have to look at this in the context of Brexit, though, because you know if we are. Uh, and I think, you know, I think it, it, it's probably uh, when, not if, you know, we leave the EU, um, then businesses are going to need all the help that they can get. Uh, and uh, at the moment, you know, they do benefit from a very competitive tax rate, 19 percent. OK, it's not going to go down to 17, but 19 is still extremely uh, competitive. And I think businesses would argue that they need that competitive rate in what could be a much colder, um, harsher um, corporate environment outside the EU than inside it. Yeah, one of the things I read about the corporation tax um, moves this week is that as that rate has come down, receipts have got, have, have got up for corporation tax. Now, many sort of advocates of low tax will say, oh, this is proof, you know, you, you, you want to you make everyone more competitive and there's more activity and you can tax more. Um, actually, it might be a slightly different situation. It might be that they've cut the rates, but they've expanded the scope of corporation tax so they're getting more that way. So that makes the Labour argument that, well, we've lived with a rate of 26% slightly different. We did, but we probably didn't have as wide a breadth of uh, base to take that tax from. Yes, I, I, I agree with all of that. And I think the other thing to bear in mind is that it's, it's important, you know, how we actually think about companies. What is a company? Um, you know, is, is a company a sort of big bad thing over there that we want to uh, demonise? Or is a company uh, a mechanism for employing people, for giving them incomes, for giving them livelihoods? And I think that's a crucial difference, actually, between, between the two sides at the moment. Exactly. So you'll have the Labour Party saying, well, we can raise corporation tax because that's companies paying that. That's not people. Yeah. And if they have to give more to the tax man, that's fewer dividends for shareholders. There's an argument about things like pension funds there. But the shareholders will take the hit. Um, the bottom line profits will take a hit, but actually that doesn't matter. Now the opponents of, that, of this say, well actually, no, it's wages that will take a hit and it's prices that will have to go up. Mm. I guess the reality is it's, it's a bit of both. These, all yeah. these things. Absolutely, it is a bit of both, but I, th I don't think that you can pretend that shareholders will take all the hit and that workers will not take any of the hit. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Um, well, there's, there's lots of things we could talk about. By the way, we should say that we're talking a lot about the Labour proposals here um, and we're concentrating on the Labour and the Conservative parties. That's, I suppose, because the next Prime Minister is going to come from one of those parties, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that, that is just a realistic uh, reflection of what the polls are, taking, are mm. telling us at the moment. You know, in fact, since the campaigns have begun, um, we have reverted back to a two party race yeah. for better or worse um, you know uh, Labour and the Conservatives uh, uh, shares have risen and the Liberal Democrats and in particular the Brexit party uh, have fallen away uh, very sharply so I do think for that reason it makes sense to talk about the two main parties. It, it does although there's a significant risk that we have another hung parliament of course and in that scenario the manifestos of um, the Liberal Democrats the SNP the Greens the, the could become party. much more important I, indeed and yeah. actually it's perhaps useful to see, particularly something like the Labour Party manifesto, as a sort of a starting point in a potential negotiation that they may find themselves in about where they want a, a potential policy to be. They need to stake out these um, quite ambitious positions because they might get reined back. Yeah, absolutely. To totally agree with that. Yeah, OK. Well, um, the final thing I wanted to talk about was Brexit. It's interesting about whether you know this is a Brexit election or not. Uh, and who wants it to be a Brexit election and who doesn't. It's sort of been about Brexit, and the Conservative Party want to make it about Brexit from one point of view, but they've stopped short of really getting into the detail of what the next phase of Brexit looks like, and that's what I wanted to dwell on a little bit. They promised to get Brexit done, and if Conservatives get a majority, which the polls suggest they will, we should be out of the EU legally by the end of January. Then starts an uh, implementation period, or a transition period until December next year, this time next year. Um, that looks like it's going to be a real crunch point and another deadline when it comes to Brexit. 
Yes, and, and, and talk to anyone who knows anything about these kinds of negotiations and they will tell you that uh, doing this in a, in a year uh, is, is, you know, completely off the, off the cards. I mean, no, it is just not going to be possible to get this done. I mean, just getting, just getting the EU uh, lined up for the negotiations is going to take a long time. Uh, these uh, trade talks will have to be signed off by each of the 27 EU countries individually. Doing this in a year is probably completely uh, unrealistic. And I think the danger is that uh, the Prime Minister is boxing himself uh, in here in order to keep the Brexiteers uh, on, on side. Uh, and I think if you think that um, uh, we're going to get Brexit done and that next year we can stop talking about Brexit, that, and I think lots of people would dearly love that to be the case, that they could stop thinking about Brexit, it's just not going to happen. The, the, the trade negotiations are the, the heart of, uh, of this and uh, Brexit will be the key topic uh, for the whole of next year, without a shadow of doubt. Yeah, and we've heard about no deal Brexit being taken off the table. And in, in one sense, the deal of a transition has been come to, or potentially come to, you'd think, particularly in the in a circumstances of a Tory majority. But you could still get a no trade deal Brexit. And that's what we're going to be talking about through next year and up to December. And still many of the sort of negative cliff edge type effects on companies and the economy still exist if we leave without a trade deal. One potential change between uh, now and, and then next year may be that having won a majority and the UK being legally out of the EU, it might be an easier conversation for Boris Johnson to have with the right of his party yeah. to say, look, you've got, we're, we're out legally, we're going to get to the destination that you want, but we need time to get these uh, discussions done in the interests of the country. Yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, we may even see a swing back uh, from the Prime Minister, if he gains a, a parliamentary ma majority, back towards the sort of one nation uh, Tory, uh, uh, which he claim, claims that he is. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, unknowns there. But I do think that what this shows is that, you know, at the heart of both the Conservatives and uh, the Labour positions at this election, there's a bit of a, there's a, there are a couple of delusions, if you like. I think on the Conservative side, there is this uh, delusion that we can get Brexit done uh, quickly and painlessly. I think the reality is this is not the end of Brexit. It's not even the beginning of the end of Brexit. It is just the end of the beginning of the Bre Brexit negotiations. On the Labour side, I think the delusion is that you can create a, a society uh, with a, a big welfare state, uh, a, a move away from the sort of private wealth and public squalor that Labour would say uh, we've created uh, under, the, under the previous administration, and that you can do that simply and costlessly for the majority of people, that it can be paid for by either rich people or companies which are not related to people. I think both of those stories are a bit of a delusion and I think that's the challenge which we face as uh, as voters in this election is making the choice between those two stories. Yeah and, and just on those Labour proposals I mean there's lots we haven't even spoken about the nationalisations we haven't particularly dwelled on a plan to give um, workers equity shares of the companies that they work for which uh, would amount uh, a, well a huge organisational change but also a big potentially a big sort of um, grab from the government because they would get a big uh, amount of the proceeds as well you can stake out those ambitions. Getting there, you know, what does a nationalisation look like? Who, you know, who, where do you get the staff to run a, a water company or a rail company if you're the government? What it actually looks like. And how long does it take? And how long does it take? Yeah. We just don't know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's fascinating. As I said at the beginning, at the top of this, uh, this chat, you know, this is the most interesting election uh, you know, that I can remember. It is indeed. Well, Tom, that is all we have time for okay. for today. Thanks a lot. Okay. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you.